Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this session on uh, Nodeless Knative, just in time all the way. Um, we're all here for Knative Con, so we don't need to be sold on why we shouldn't have always on applications. It's about time to move from always on apps to just in time apps. So treat apps as pets, not as pets, but as cattle. Um, and looking at the infra backing serverless applications, uh, Kubernetes gives you a lot of operational simplicity. So it's awesome to run um, your serverless applications on Kubernetes. And again, we are at KnativeCon, so I don't have to sell you on that. But why stop at Kubernetes? Why not take the concept of just-in-time all the way down to Kubernetes infra itself? That is where Nodeless comes in. Nodeless basically looks at compute as commodity and not as pets. So the idea of Nodeless is to take your compute that's backing a Kubernetes cluster or a fleet of Kubernetes clusters and convert it from being hand managed and treated as pets to commodity that comes up just in time and goes away when it is no longer needed. And that's where um, Nodeless comes in. So Nodeless can work at in two phases. At the first phase, if you think about a single Kubernetes cluster that's backing your Knative functions, you don't need to have any compute nodes backing your control plane at all. The moment a function starts up and its corresponding pod is started, just-in-time compute that is bespoke and cost efficient for the pod is provisioned just in time. It's a regular kubelet worker node and it joins the control plane. Your pod is shipped to the, uh, to the just-in-time provisioned compute node. And once the pod is terminated, the underlying compute automatically goes away. The nice thing about uh, nodeless for a single control plane is that it will pull from the latest and greatest fleet of compute that's available in your cloud environment, whether it be ARM device shapes or on-demand spot, Fargate, or any kind of compute shape that's, that is available to your Kubernetes cluster account that will, that will be used to source your just-in-time compute. Um, so let's look at what are the options for for using just-in-time compute for a single Kubernetes cluster. There is the default cluster autoscaler, which does bin packing, which is packing of your pods into larger compute nodes. But there are also other options that do bin selection, which is basically provision a single compute node per pod, which suits really well for Knative functions because the form factor is pretty small for these pods and there are um, economical compute shapes like ARM shapes and smaller size on demand and spot instances that are really good fit from a resource footprint point of view to fit your function pods into the just-in-time provisioned uh, compute. Um, there is Carpenter project from AWS, there's Autopilot from GCP, and there's also Luna, which is a cloud vendor agnostic and control plane agno agnostic project. So let's look at how um, just-in-time compute would look for a single Kubernetes cluster. I hope the font size is uh, large enough. If it is too small in the back rows, can you please let me know? Is it okay? Cool. So out here, I have a single Kubernetes cluster that is running on AWS, on EKS, and it has uh, two Knative services running, hello and hello Knative con. And I'm looking at the pods in the environment and also the nodes in the environment. So this Kubernetes cluster is running Luna, which is one of the nodeless options for, um, for any public cloud control plane. And there are two compute nodes that are currently running, and these are running system resources, system, system pods, et cetera. Now, if I go ahead and curl the um, Knative con endpoint, what we want to see is we want to see just-in-time pod come up and it is in pending state. It's, that's because the nodeless component looks at the a pod's resource footprint and it provisions just-in-time compute that is right-sized and also the most cost-effective for the pod. So for the first connection, this would take a while because uh, in my current configuration, I don't have pre-warm nodes, but there is also a, a config option knob that you can turn that will have pre-warm nodes so that you don't pay this cold start uh, overhead. 
once the once the compute node is provisioned, um, it should be available as ready in the bottom window. And once the node is available, the pod would be scheduled to the just-in-time provision node, and your uh, you should your app should get a response. So for the first call, we might see a timeout, but from the second call onwards. And for auto scaling, it should respond as soon as possible. So the kind of worker node that is provisioned just in time is a regular kubelet worker. It is nothing special. It has the regular kubelet worker stack running on it. And it's, it pops up. It's the most cost effective uh, compute node for the resource footprint for your application. For example, if you need one vCPU, one gig of RAM um, uh, resources for your application pod, the compute node that's provisioned will, will be one vCPU, one gig of RAM. And it can be an on-demand instance. It could be a spot instance. It could be a Fargate launch type. Whatever launch types are available for your cloud account for that cluster, they will be used for uh, sourcing the right size compute. And once the compute is available and ready, the pod will transition into pod creating, uh, container creating state. Uh, there you go. So the uh, pod has transitioned into container creating state. And once the container is up and running, we should um, see the response. So let me actually create another curl, my second endpoint, which is hello. And we should see the same workflow get repeated. So the second pod is in pending state. The first one is in running state. And we should see a fourth compute node pop up just in time. There are also knobs that you can configure where uh, compute nodes after the pod terminates, the compute node is still alive for a little while. So you have a pre-warm node if the traffic is spiking. So there is, there's a lot of throttling that can be done on the compute node side. So you're not paying for um, cold start times. I'm going to pause here to see if this makes sense because uh, we want to cl clarify that nodeless makes sense for a single cluster before moving to the multi-cluster scenario. Are there any questions? So with this, I guess, with your deployment, is this assuming that you always have defined requests and limit types on each deployment? That's a really good question. So by default, it works off of the requests and limits. But if requests and limits are not set, vertical pod autoscaler will uh, right size the requests and limits. So if the pod, for example, if you did not specify uh, pod requests and limits, um, you a nodeless will by default pick the smallest instance type, and vertical pod autoscaler will notice that it is using more CPU or more RAM than what, what is available, and it will adjust the requests and limits for the pod accordingly. So that the next iteration onwards, it is going to get larger compute shapes and not uh, default super small compute shapes. Does that make sense? Yep, and where does it store that like inventory? Like when it takes that snapshot and then re like recalibrates it essentially, where does it put that? Like how does it know for the next instantiation that it must have more compute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is vertical pod autoscaler that is typically used in conjunction with Nodeless. So the way vertical, vertical pod autoscaler is, is a Kubernetes project. So it comes in three modes. The first mode is uh, do not change the resource spec for the pod. The second is forcibly terminate the pod and restart it with the new updated resource recommendations. And the third one is only apply the updated resource recommendations when the operator restarts the pod. So um, based on how aggressive you want to be with, with adjusting your resource recommendations, you can pick one of the three. The most popularly used option is um, restart when the next, don't force restart, but apply it when the next time the pod is started by the operator. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions on single, sorry. Uh, hold on one second. Can we, can we get that off the recording? Uh, so just to clarify, you're running full Kubernetes node for this function. What's that? 
Are you running like full uh, full Kubernetes node for this function? Yes, yeah. But yeah. are you worried about overhead, like Kubelet take resources, Docker take resources? All yeah, stuff yeah, that's a really good question. So um, Nodeless actually does a cost benefit of whether it makes sense to have one compute node per function or stuff multiple functions into a single compute node. So it is it does make the cost benefit analysis of should we stuff multiple functions into a single worker node? Or does it make sense to have one function in a sing, in in one one worker node? So it, it makes that call based on the resource footprint as well as the behavior patterns of how the pods were started and at what rate are they coming in. So it, it it doesn't always do one compute node per pod. It does it when it makes sense from an economics point of view as well as the rate at which the pods are being provisioned and terminated point of view. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, it obviously doesn't make sense to have one compute node per pod if the resource footprint is super, super, super small. Um, any other questions on the single node? So we would eventually see the two nodes that were provisioned um, for the functions. This one, the 40.74 and 71.251, they should eventually go away when we don't have any more traffic coming in. So we'll revisit this window after a while. So taking it one step further, do we really even need control planes that are sitting always on? Um, if you have, if you want to serve your functions on, Back, backed by hundreds of Kubernetes clusters, should we have these control planes that are always on? And why can't we take it one step further and have just-in-time control planes that are popping up if there is a workload that is scheduled to that control plane? And if no workloads are running on the control plane, why should we even maintain a control plane and why should it be on? So a nodeless when applied to a multi-cluster environment, um, it provisions just-in-time clusters. Um, the control planes are provisioned in the right cloud provider in the right region if a workload is scheduled to that control plane. Let's say your workload needs ARM device shape uh, X or GPU shape Y, and those shapes are only available in region A in AWS and region B in GCP. Um, the multi-cluster scheduler for just-in-time clusters would be smart enough to figure out, hey, this, this function needs these resource shapes and these are only available in these cloud providers in these regions. So I'm gonna spin up just-in-time control planes in those regions and schedule my function pod to that particular control plane. Um, and once no workloads are running in the control planes, the control planes themselves en enter standby mode, so they won't be always on. So you're not incurring the overhead of maintaining control planes and maintain and figuring out, hey, which version, what, what are the uh, security patches that are applied to all the compute nodes in this control plane, etc. So let's go ahead and see um, how this would work. The environment is slightly different from the um, from the cluster environment, from the AWS environment. So here I have, let me bring it up to the top. So here I have um, a federation of two clusters, and these are both kind clusters running on my laptop. And you see that they both uh, they both have ready set to false, so the control planes are not ready. They're simply in um, standby mode. Idle set to true, which means that there are zero workloads running on the control planes, and uh, they are on standby, which means that if a workload happens to be scheduled to this control plane, it'll come back up alive. So um, we also want to make sure that there are no workloads running on, um, on this federation of clusters. So we see that there are no pods running. Um, let's go ahead and, and create an application that's scheduled to, let me create um, Nginx that is scheduled to this federated Kubernetes cluster. And what we want to see is that the uh, one of the clusters should get out of standby mode. Let me see where the pods are running. Um, 
Okay, so the pod got for Nginx deployment, the pod got scheduled to the first cluster. So it got scheduled to the first cluster. So if we look at the um, get clusters again, we see that the first cluster is now ready. It's, it's gotten out of standby mode and it is now ready. Um, and it is running the Nginx deployment pods. So if we delete the Nginx deployment, we should see that after a while, the first uh, cluster should enter standby mode. So if we delete the Nginx deployment, we make sure that the pods are terminated. What we want to see is, uh, let's watch. So after a while, we'll see that the cluster one, because it's not running any pods, it should transition to uh, standby set to true. So we'll have just-in-time control planes that will come up and disappear based on the function life cycle. And if the function happens to be scheduled to this control plane that has the resources that are needed to run the workload. Um, I'm going to pause here to see if it makes sense and if there are any questions. So let's go back to takeaways. We'll revisit the slide in a bit. Always on apps, um, if possible, they, uh, it, it's easier, and simpler, and more cost effective to move towards event-driven functions. And that's why we are here. And backing your serverless functions by Kubernetes simplifies your operations quite a bit. And why stop with just in time uh, stack there? Why not, why not convert your Kubernetes cluster, each Kubernetes cluster into a nodeless mode. So you get just-in-time compute for your just-in-time function. And taking it one step further, uh, having just-in-time clusters themselves is actually making sure that you have a just-in-time stack end-to-end -end from your function all the way to your infra. So if you have zero pods running, zero apps running, zero functions running, your resource footprint and your infra footprint is zero. You're not maintaining fleet of clusters or compute nodes that are always on waiting to run your resources. Um, does that make sense? Yep. So let's go back and revisit the two demo. Um, so we see that it entered standby, the first cluster entered standby. So it takes two minutes for each state transition. So two minutes after it gets idle, it enters standby. And um, after that, ready should get to be false pretty soon. And let's go back and look at the nodes on the single cluster. And we see that the two nodes that were provisioned um, for just-in-time function pods have been terminated. So we are back to a stable state of two worker nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, let's watch until this thing transitions to false while I take on any more questions. I'll update the slide deck uh, on SCED, and I have a recorded version of both the demo videos as well, so I'll make sure that I'll update it to SCED as well, so you have a copy of it. Oh, I guess I have a question, so I don't have to run the mic to myself. Um, so in this example, you're showing two different clusters, and you used uh, cube control create to de create a deployment that was gonna end up in one cluster. Um, how does this work with Knative where the deployment will exist, but it will be at zero replicas and there is some sort of ingress? Where does that ingress run? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, this one for the multi-cluster demo. I did not use the Knative stack. I just wanted to illustrate how the scheduling works and all that. So for, for the multi-cluster thing, we would have federated Knative stack running. The deployment, the way multi-cluster scheduling works is uh, the main scheduler, which is called Nova, it is simply an API server. So your Knative stack will be running there and um, it takes care of scheduling and federating your deployment. So the moment your deployment object is created and you're scaling the number of replicas, those objects get scheduled to the right workload cluster and it takes care of the networking component and setting up uh, ingress components. So the objects are pushed down to the workload cluster. So there would be, 
Envoy and activators running somewhere. Yes. On one of one or more of those clusters. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we are also looking into uh, Tanzu service mesh as well, trying to make sure it makes uh, to see if the global namespaces, all of those can be used because what uh, the scheduler does is it simply schedules the compute objects. So it, it has the smarts to figure out, hey, I want to schedule 80% of my workload to cluster A and 20% to cluster B, but it is not taking care of inter-cluster networking. So we would need to integrate with something like um, Envoy or Service Mesh. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think you just said at the end, if you're Envoy, like your Istio, um, ended up in one cluster and your Knative activator ended up in another, you might not get activations working properly without extra work? Yes, yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so right now, the first phase, we are scheduling the whole stack to a single cluster. Um, but what we are looking to see is, can we actually have a federation of Knative stack that's running on the multiple control planes as well? Uh, that would actually make it a lot more highly available than scheduling the entire K-native serving stack onto a single workload cluster. But first step, we are trying to do schedule everything into a siloed control plane. Any other questions? Well, thanks so much. This was uh, super valuable to hear your questions. Mm -hmm.